Heroes, Episode 65, The Winds of Winter Primer, Part 10, In the Dothraki Sea. Spoilers all books! Hello and welcome to another episode of Radio Westeros. I'm Lady Guinevere and with me, as always, is Young Boy. Yeah, hi there everyone and thanks for being here. In today's episode, we're going to continue our The Winds of Winter Primer series with an in-depth look at Daenerys Targaryen. We will assess Danny's story as it relates to Slaver's Bay and follow her journey to the Dothraki Sea where she was last seen at the end of A Dance with Dragons. And we'll begin by recapping when Danny conquered Slaver's Bay and, rather than heading immediately towards Westeros, decided to stay in Marine to rule. There is much to say about her transition from conqueror to ruler, given that she aims to repeat the same cycle again when she sets her sights on the Iron Throne. From there, we'll look closely at the events of Daznak's Pit, as she makes huge compromises to her leadership ideals and presides over ruthless gladiatorial combat in the arena. However, with an unexpected appearance from Drogon, Danny leaves the pit on the dragon's back and soon finds herself stranded in the Dothraki Sea. We'll follow her journey, analyse her final chapter and speculate what might come next for her as George leaves us with one of his trademark cliffhangers. And most or all of us are probably expecting Danny to return to Marine in the Winds of Winter, so we'll also assess the potential character interactions she faces when she arrives in that busy city, given that she'll surely be looking to shuffle her pack and create an effective team primed to invade Westeros. And finally, we'll take a quick look at how she might get there and what could happen when she does. Danny's story in The Winds of Winter promises to be packed with action, tension and heaps of character development, and today's episode will bring you up to speed on her past, present and future. This is the final instalment of our Primer series, so we aim to go out on a high. And before we begin, we want to shout out our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington, our Dragonsteel patron, Peter, and our Pale as Milk Glass patrons, Daniel, Joel I the Three-Eyed Bro, Seth, Kelly, Laura, Sister Winter, Pepper Nix, Multude, Scotty, John Wigarian, B-Word, the Queen Beyond the Wall, and Mr. J, the Red Shirt in Black, and Chris B, the Song of Ice. Thanks so much to all of our patrons, and if you enjoy this episode and this series, please consider being a patron and obtain perks such as shoutouts, early access to ad-free episodes, and an invite to our Discord forum. Look for Radio Westeros at patreon.com. And now, let's get started with The Winds of Winter Primer, Part 10, In the Dothraki Sea. Do you know what it is like to be sold, Squire? I do. My brother sold me to Khal Drogo for the promise of a golden crown. Well, Drogo crowned him in gold, though not as he had wished, and I... My son and stars made a queen of me, but if he had been a different man, it might have been much otherwise. Do you think I have forgotten how it felt to be afraid? In the Game of Thrones, Daenerys Targaryen begins the saga as chattel, sold off by her brother Viserys to Dothraki horse lord Khal Drogo. This experience affected Danny deeply, and so is it any wonder that she maintained a firm objection to the slave trade that is pervasive in much of Essos. In perhaps the most noble and audacious manoeuvre in the series, Danny attempts to uproot slavery in the region and replace it with a newfound sense of liberation. We can't say enough about Danny's achievements and intentions here, and it's clear that George wants us to root for this character at this stage in the story. However, George has often said that he doesn't like to make things too easy for his main characters, and after the high of seeing young Daenerys endeavor to turn the ingrained evil on its head, the author introduces layers of complications which at once challenge her ideals and impede her ambition to sail to Westeros. Here, we'll look at those problems, explore where they originate, and discuss why these obstacles are so difficult for her to overcome. 
In the Storm of Swords, Daenerys Targaryen sweeps through Slaver's Bay with great haste, displaying her abilities as a conqueror in taking the three cities of Astapor, Yunkai and Marine. While these manoeuvres assure the reader that her inspiring military leadership promises a decent tilt at the Iron Throne one day, her acumen as a ruler remains unproven. In A Dance with Dragons, she decides to stay in Marine and rule over the city and its people, and we soon realise doing so will be more problematic for her than the conquering was. It turns out the problems Danny faces in Marine are not in spite of her conquest, but in fact are inextricably linked to the brazen style with which she swept over the bay, leaving her with a tangled knot of interleaving dilemmas. A quick overview of the situation in Marine highlights ten discernible problems Danny must confront in A Dance with Dragons and beyond. The Sons of the Harpy, Uniting Marine, Slavery, Her Dragons, Food, Trade, Disease, Astapor, Yunkai, and Preparing to Go to Westeros. We'll endeavor to briefly outline how these dilemmas relate to one another, manifesting in a complex Rubik's Cube of a political problem for Queen Daenerys. First of all, the Sons of the Harpy begin a shadow war in defiance of Danny's rule and her anti-slavery policies, and represent the continual threat of an uprising from the conquered masters. Meanwhile in Astapor, where Danny left a healer, a scholar and a priest in charge without the aid of a significant military force, the city has fallen into the hands of Cleon the Butcher, the first of a string of reprehensible would-be kings. While Astapor is in dire need of assistance, both within the city and regarding its proposition of war with the Yunkish, Danny dare not leave Marine nor send away her forces for fear that the sons of the harpy might instigate an uprising. She thinks, All my victories turn to dross in my hands. Whatever I do, all I make is death and horror. And if I had marched to Astapor, I would have lost Marine. As a consequence, Astapor suffers tremendously. Defeat by the Yunkish is followed by an outbreak of the bloody flux in the midst of slaughter, starvation, and even cannibalism. And with Astapor now on its knees, the Yunkai are well-placed to turn their gaze toward Marine itself, the embryonic setup of the Battle of Fire. The Astapori refugees are driven towards Marine, bringing with them the pale mare which rides over their camps. This can be viewed as Danny's leadership failures arriving on her doorstep. Leaving Astapor unguarded was a crucial mistake, and along with leaving Yunkai untaken, it has set off a chain reaction of further problems. As an Astapori petitioner tells her, you gave us death, not freedom. Another problem Danny has is trade. The local economy was built around slavery, and the ripple effect of the upheaval causes the city-state of Carth to resent Danny, given the impact of her actions on their own economy and culture. Danny wants to trade with her former Carthine host, Zaro Zohan Daxos, but instead he offers her 13 ships to take to Westeros. Not wanting to abandon her city, Danny refuses the ships, a decision which sparks war. The Carthine fleet blockades Miranese waters, and Danny struggles to retaliate given she dismantled her own ships to craft siege engines. Again, the manner of her conquest is the root cause of her problems. The lack of trade in Marine overlaps with the shortage of food in Marine. Food sources, such as olive groves, were destroyed by the old masters in order to starve Danny's sizable forces and the freedmen. Ironically, it was the Valyrians who beggared the area and sowed the local soil with salt to cause widespread ruin many generations ago. Marine has therefore, for generations, been unable to meet the level of self-sufficiency required to thrive without food imports, and now their post-slavery economy is beginning to flatline. When the Astapori arrive outside the city walls, suffering and starving and in dire need of aid, 
Danny cannot afford the food to feed them. She thinks, All I did in Astapor was make 10,000 arrowways, a reference to the Lazarine girl Danny tried to save from Drogo's Kalasar, only to see her spitefully raped and murdered in the wake of Drogo's death. With these dilemmas weighing heavily on her day after day, coupled with the time-consuming responsibilities of ruling, another problem arises. Danny has little time for her dragons. Soon a child, Hazir, falls prey to Drogon, and as a result, all three dragons are locked away in a makeshift dragon pit within the Great Pyramid, meaning that Danny has lost a great military deterrent, and thus her enemies become emboldened. Brown Ben Plum recognises this fact and turns his sellsword company, the Second Sons, to the Yunkish, which is a significant loss to Danny. Although she tries to please the Miranese, there always seem to be dire consequences for her well-intentioned actions. Yeah, in Marine, Danny is torn between playing the conqueror, ruler, and playing the savior figure, exemplified by the fact that she demands child hostages but refuses to harm them when ultimatums are betrayed. There's a dichotomy within Danny's soul as she learns the reality of leadership and rule, that it's difficult or nigh on impossible to be both a conqueror and a Misa in this part of the world, and that the road to hell is truly paved with good intentions. And as we've said, many of these problems can be traced back to the haste with which she conquered an area of the map she knew very little about. At the end of her rope, in search of peace and an answer to the many intertwining problems we've highlighted, Danny decides to marry Miranese nobleman Hisdar Zolorak, despite being in love with sellsword rogue Dario Naharis, proving that as a leader she is willing to sacrifice something of herself for the wider benefit of her subjects. It says, My people are bleeding, dying. A queen belongs not to herself, but to the realm. Marriage or carnage, those are my choices. A wedding or a war. And the wedding came with yet more strings attached and compromises to her authority and ethos. Following his dar's negotiations on her behalf, Yunkai was to be allowed to practice slave trading again, and they provocatively set up a human market right outside the walls of her city. The fighting pits, where men tear each other apart for the amusement of the crowd, were slated to be reopened. Danny's dreams of a more civilized and slavery-free Slaver's Bay are further crushed under the weight of politics and incessant complications. It seems in hindsight that she tried to bring change to the region too soon and that the slaver's culture runs too deep, perhaps dating back thousands of years. Whereas after A Storm of Swords, we might have viewed Danny's spontaneity as a great strength, this far into A Dance with Dragons, we wonder if her impulsiveness has triggered a domino effect that could yet destroy Marine and that the city is in danger of becoming another Astapor. Danny's forebear, Aegon the Conqueror, spent years assessing Westeros before he invaded, and while his conquest took nearly two years and was not without its setbacks, it was in most regards efficient and merciful wherever possible, succeeding in its end goal of creating a united kingdom ready to thrive. Sadly, this effort stands in contrast to Danny's attempt in Slaver's Bay, where despite her early victories and her admirable opposition to slavery, the campaign has largely been a failure thus far, in the short term at least. Next, Danny must pay the price of peace and preside over the reopening of Dasnak's pit as a celebration for her marriage to Hisdar. It seems, though, that Danny herself has little to celebrate. Even if the pits must open, must your grace go yourself? asked Miss Ande as she was washing the queen's hair. Half of Marine will be there to see me, gentle heart. Your grace, said Miss Ande. This one begs leave to say that half of Marine will be there to watch men bleed and die. 
She's not wrong, the queen knew, but it makes no matter. Daenerys' struggle to address the multi-layered socio-economic complexities she finds herself overwhelmed by in Slaver's Bay, which we discussed in the prior segment as being either a manifestation of the long and brutal cultural history in the area or the result of Danny's ambition to unravel such grotesque traditions by a rapid display of force, all funnel down into the climactic moment of her A Dance with Dragon's arc. In Daenerys 9, her penultimate chapter in the novel, and following her marriage of convenience and appeasement to Miranese nobleman Hisdar Zolorak, she is obliged to preside over the reopening of the savage fighting arena named Dasnak's Pit. While Daenerys had scored significant victories over the slave trade, burning, crucifying, and uprooting as she made inroads through the area, when the dust finally settled, the harsh reality of the new liberty she had hoped would sweep over Marine became clear. Before long, and facing pushback seemingly from every direction, Daenerys found herself compromising in order to protect her people and establish peace within the city. The reopening of the fighting pits was symbolic of that compromise, and for Daenerys, seeding lines in the sand that she'd drawn firmly in order to create a more humane and decent society did not feel like a healthy trade-off, but rather a resounding loss she felt deeply within her empathetic heart. On one hand, there were notable improvements to proceedings in the pit. Strictly speaking, the fighters and the pit's personnel will no longer be slaves, and the gravity of this sea change cannot be understated. Yet, the strength of the former bloodlust had not eroded in the way that Daenerys hoped, and ultimately the fighters are as poised to rip each other to pieces for the entertainment of the crowd as they would have been were they still slaves. While Hisdar comments enthusiastically on the fighting, Danny thinks on the inevitability of the death of all the fighters. And when, in the searing heat, Daenerys sees a palanquin overturned due to its bearer collapsing, she herself has to order the man be protected and assisted. Get him off the streets before he's stepped on and give him food and water. He looks as though he's not eaten in a fortnight, she commands. As the brazen beasts do as they are bid and aid the man, Danny says to his dar, Those bearers were slaves before I came. I made them free. Yet that palanquin is no lighter. Although the bearer is now a free man on paper, his life in the main is no less difficult than before, and there's every indication it may be somewhat worse. Forced to survive on what are no doubt meager wages, It's insinuated that he's starving and is being worked to death as a result. His star responds by noting that the man is now paid a wage, though he fails to acknowledge its inadequacy, and points out that he would have been whipped and punished for collapsing under the old slaver's regime. Danny acknowledges the truth in that and thinks grudgingly, I suppose I must be thankful for small victories. And there is some evidence that marginal victories to come about under Danny's rule are in fact taking root. While Daenerys notes that the event includes a diverse set of fighters, pale Carthine, black summer islanders, copper-skinned Dothraki, Tyroshi with blue beards, lamb men, Jogos Nai, sullen bravosi, brindle-skinned half-men from the jungles of Sothoros, from the ends of the world, they came to die at Dasnak's pit. We also learn that none of the day's fighters are children, a rule which seems to be upheld by the organizers and highlights a boundary installed by the queen that will be respected. A young man 16 years old is shown to lose a fight and be subsequently gutted, which of course is offensive to every fiber of Daenerys's being, yet she takes solace in the fact that no one younger than 16 should ever suffer the same fate. Another small victory, she thinks. Perhaps I cannot make my people good, she told herself, but I should at least try to make them a little less bad. 
Danny's wish that no women enter the pit was rejected, given she had granted women freedom, and as such would find it difficult then to deny them the right to fight freely as the men were allowed to. In this case, the Miranese are using Daenerys' own philosophy against her, which traps her into agreement. Yet, none of the example capture the essence of Daenerys' struggle more succinctly than that of the dwarves' folly. Danny is noted to have sought to ban such follies, comic combats where, quote, cripples, dwarfs, and crones had at one another with cleavers, torches, and hammers. Yet Hisdar had explained that without the follies, these unfortunate souls would face starvation and death. This is a microcosm of the dilemma Danny faces as she seeks to transition the region from slavery to a free labor economy. Unable to find a solution, Danny relents. But even with Danny compromising on so many of her ideals, the Miranese will continue to push back against her boundaries. Yeah, when the dwarf slaves, who we know to be Tyrion Lannister and Penny, perform their folly with Pretty Pig and Crunch the Dog, they are oblivious to the plan that would see ravenous lions loosed upon them for the amusement of the onlookers. Even before Danny learns of this plot, she is uncomfortable with the scene and soon halts proceedings and saves the life of the man who in all likelihood will become a great asset to her as an advisor. She demands of Hisdar, you swore to me that the fighters would be grown men who had freely consented to risk their lives for gold and honour. These dwarves did not consent to battle lions with wooden swords. You will stop it now. Although Hisdar agrees to her demand, she notices a flash of anger in his eyes, and the whole scene is emblematic of how characters of power in Marine will continually push and gnaw at the boundaries Danny is laying down. If she had not been there, the lions would have eaten Tyrion and Penny alive in an obvious erosion of the rules set forth by the Queen. And remember, those two shouldn't have even been in the pit, as per Danny's decree that no slaves be involved. This is the pressure Daenerys is continually up against in Marine. It's not the establishment of laws, rules, and standards, but the guarding and maintaining of them against the continual force of local counterflow. There are other small victories noted by Daenerys. Murderers and rapists could be forced to fight, but not debtors or thieves who might themselves be downtrodden victims. The carcasses of any animals that have died fighting are mixed into a stew which is offered to poor citizens at no cost. A good law, says Danny before thinking. You have so few of them. Altogether, there are signs of progress in Marine, but for the most part, they're small and inadequate. Where a leader with a lesser sense of empathy and ambition might settle for compromise, Danny takes it as a defeat. Perhaps the problem is that Daenerys wishes to expedite the healing of Marine at a pace which is simply unrealistic given the depth of the root causes. Change takes time. And from our own world and our own history, we know that even when positive change is initiated and gains irresistible momentum, vestiges of old cruelties can linger for generation upon generation. Perhaps, as a leader, Danny was running before she could walk. When Hisdar offers some consolation to counter Danny's sense of disillusionment, he says, One step, then the next, and soon we shall be running. Together we shall make a new marine. The flip side of this statement, though, crystallizes Danny's doubts. One step, then the next, but where is it I'm going? With all that said, though, Danny's central cause to rid the area of the twisted spectre of the trade in innocent human beings is both admirable and worthy. In spite of her final resignation as she departs Dasnek's pit in truly remarkable fashion, she's not blind to the positive changes taking place. Although the pace of reform might seem glacial to her, to call Daenerys' conquering of Slaver's Bay a Pyrrhic victory at this stage seems premature. 
the fragile seeds she has planted might yet take root and grow, multiply and flourish, bringing about a revolution of culture in marine for future generations. By the same token, her influence could diminish over time and appear as a blip on the slaver's timeline. Who knows how she'll be viewed in the area in a hundred years' time when only her legacy remains. In order to give that legacy a solid foundation and to give Marine a fair chance at continued freedom and stability when she finally moves toward her Westerosi destiny, Daenerys Targaryen must leave the city in trustworthy and capable hands. The new rulers must have the intelligence and means to resist oppressive forces for generations to come, lest her legacy become that of a Misa who abandoned her children. It's a tall order, and we wait with some degree of trepidation to see what crucial decisions she'll make upon her inevitable return to Marine in the Winds of Winter. Next up, we'll recap Daenerys's flight from Dasnak's pit on Drogon's back and her current situation stranded in the Dothraki Sea. A shadow rippled across the sky. The tumult and the shouting died. Ten thousand voices stilled. Every eye turned skyward. A warm wind brushed Danny's cheeks. And above the beating of her heart, she heard the sound of wings. So far, we've focused on the manifold problems Daenerys faced in A Dance with Dragons up until that fateful moment at Dasnak's pit when Drogon carried her away. The dense Miranese plot, with its many threads and twists and dilemmas, encourages us to measure Danny's skills as a leader and to consider the complexities and mitigating factors that allow a more nuanced overview of the situation. But with the socio-political upheaval having been well documented by our earlier segments, it would be remiss of us to neglect the human story underpinning all of this intrigue, that of our POV, Daenerys Targaryen herself. As Daenerys accepted her role as Queen of Marine and Misa to her people, even in the naivete of her youth, she knew that this privilege would come with great responsibility. Sacrifices and compromise would have to be made not only in the arena of political hard bargaining, but in her personal life too. As the Miranese plotlines unfurl, we see Dany giving more and more of herself for the greater good of her subjects. And of course, we would be hesitant to portray Daenerys as the victim in circumstances which see a child roasted alive, a deluge of diseased and famished refugees deny the safety of the city, and the wave of other atrocities occurring in Astapor, Yunkai, and within Marine itself. Yet Danny has carried the great weight of these burdens on her young shoulders, becoming increasingly selfless as time went on, and the psychological strain of being Queen of Marine in a time of conflict and upheaval has taken its toll. Thus far, Daenerys has resisted the urge to follow her dreams across the narrow sea to Westeros, instead relishing the responsibilities of leadership. She chained up her three dragons as a response to the killing of the child Hazia, and she married a man she felt no warmth towards in order to secure an elusive peace for her people, which came with enough strings attached to make her feel as if she were being puppeteered. There's no denying that during all of this she would have rather been daydreaming of her red door and flirting with the flamboyant Lothario Dario Naharis, But let's not forget that Danny is a mere 16 years old by the end of A Dance with Dragons. She is empathetic to all those innocent souls less fortunate than herself, and whatever the outcome, attempts to put them first at all costs. Given her ambitions to rid the world of slavery, Danny continues to exhibit a selflessness and philosophical wisdom far beyond her years. There is pathos to be found all through her leadership arc when we consider that she herself began the story as chattel sold off to a barbarian horse lord. 
So when Daenerys is obliged to sit in Dasnak's pit, witnessing a boar tear apart a female fighter in front of 30,000 cheering onlookers, and after everything that's gone wrong within and without her city, all the scheming that has defied her resolve at every turn, and all the systemic evil of Slaver's Bay manifesting in an indefatigable resistance to her policies of liberty and emancipation, is it any wonder that she would relish an escape? Above them all the dragon turned dark against the sun. His scales were black, his eyes and horns and spinal plates blood red. Ever the largest of her three, in the wild Drogon had grown larger still, His wings stretched twenty feet from tip to tip, black as jet. He flapped them once as he swept back above the sands, and the sound was like a clap of thunder. The boar raised his head, snorting, and flame engulfed him. Black fire shot with red. Danny felt the wash of heat thirty feet away. The beast's dying screams sounded almost human. Drogon landed on the carcass and sank his claws into the smoking flesh. As he began to feed... He made no distinction between Barsina and the boar. As a bellicose would-be hero spears Drogon, it says the dragon and Daenerys screamed as one. Whereas everyone else in sight wants the dragon dead, Danny attempts to tame the beast she thinks of as her metaphorical child. Attempting to hide her fear and acknowledging the danger she's in, Danny grabs the pitmaster's whip and soon finds herself on the dragon's back, wrenching the hero's spear free from between his scales, and finds a strange kinship with the creature when she thinks, he is fire-made flesh, and so am I. In this climactic moment, it says, the black wings cracked like thunder and suddenly the scarlet sands were falling away beneath her. Dizzy, Danny closed her eyes. When she opened them again, she glimpsed the Marinese beneath her through a haze of tears and dust, pouring up the steps and out into the streets. With all of her problems fading away in the distance and coming to a blur, is it any wonder she begins to enjoy this moment? Danny found freedom just as Drogon had, and George's use of sexual innuendo is not in your imagination. Such language is used to convey Daenerys's excitement at her impromptu escape. Danny could feel the heat of him between her thighs. Her heart felt as if it were about to burst. Yes, she thought. Yes, now, now, do it, do it. Take me, take me, fly. Not to put too fine a point on it, but we did say this was a climactic moment. Now Danny has essentially run away from her problems. It wasn't her intention or her plan, but that's where George has taken her character. But a real leader doesn't run and hide, so we fully expect that what follows is a time of respite and rejuvenation from the frantic pace of the city before a dramatic return to Meereen during the winds of winter. Barristan gains a POV and is our eyes within Marine as the city hurtles towards a large-scale war against Yung Kai and other hostile factions, which George is calling the Battle of Fire. However, away from the city, away from the complications and dilemmas and the wheels within wheels, we're given the final chapter in A Dance with Dragons, in which Danny finds herself stranded in the endless grassland of the Dothraki Sea. All the way back in A Game of Thrones, she had traveled through these plains with Drogo's Dothraki Kalasar. And we're going to refrain from giving you our what will happen next summations just yet. Those will be saved for the next segment. Yeah, let's focus on what's happening now with Danny. Standing in contrast to the frantic hive of activity that is Marine, in the final chapter proper of A Dance with Dragons, she finds herself alone. In stripping down her surroundings, giving her distance from the multitude of problems she's tangled up in, and in spiriting her away from the many characters inhabiting the city, George is creating a segue in Danny's leadership story. 
Following the chaos of Daznak's pit, Danny is given room to breathe. While George risked writing a chapter that may have been rather sparse, this new direction allows the impetus for change and character growth. We're also given a more clear window into Danny's state of mind as she herself examines her interior world. It's not easy to write a chapter where a character doesn't once talk to another character, but George steers us through the unending wilderness deftly and maintains our interest by focusing on memories and her relationships with characters that are in some way important to her. All the while, Danny struggles to adapt to her new environment, and the mode of conflict in this chapter, for the most part, is woman versus nature. And just at her lowest ebb, George places a cliffhanger so intriguing that we are dying to know what happens next. The promise George is making to the reader in this chapter is this. Change is coming for Daenerys, both internally and externally, and it's coming soon. The chapter is packed with cognitive dissonance. Danny is somewhat confused about who she is and what she wants. In one paragraph, she yearns for home, which has always been a strange concept for her. Yet here she's thinking of the city she flew away from. Her home was back in Marine, with her husband and her lover. That was where she belonged, surely. In literally the next paragraph, Daenerys fantasizes about being on Dragonback, away from the city, away from everything. On Drogon's back she felt whole, it says. Up in the sky the woes of this world could not touch her. How could she abandon that? By showing us the contradictions in Danny's wants, needs and motives, George is initiating change. Danny has to ruminate over her choices before she can make the critical decisions which will one day define her character. On this journey outside Marine, wherever it takes her, she will realise what she wants and how to achieve her goals. Being in the city was a stifling experience, and here she is being reduced and simplified for her own benefit, and perhaps that's why she admits to feeling happy here, in spite of the hunger and hurt she also describes... In one flight, George has taken her from riches to rags, and of course this change in direction keeps the reader engaged and surprised. Having travelled through the Dothraki Sea early in A Game of Thrones, George reminds us of the broader details. We get an overview of her time with Drogo, the journey through the Red Waste, leading into a recap of the events at Daznak's Pit, As the one who brought three dragons into the world as conqueror of Slaver's Bay and Queen of Marine, Daenerys maneuvered herself into positions of ever greater power, testament to her mettle as a character, yet any such memories here are juxtaposed with the reality that she is now powerless, struggling to survive, and completing the simplest of tasks with great difficulty. Her hats all fell to pieces in her hands, Try again, she told herself. You'll do better the next time. You are the blood of the dragon. You can make a hat. She tried and tried, but her last attempt had been no more successful than her first. She thinks of Baristan, Hisdar, and her Dothraki companions as she wonders if rescue could be on its way. But the first significant relationship she contemplates is with her lover Dario, who might face trouble after boasting of bedding Danny and thus demonstrating to the young Kai his worth as a captive. She perhaps faces a difficult decision regarding Dario. In Baristan's POV, we sense that he wishes she would outgrow him and that his presence is impeding Danny's ambitions. In Danny's POV, we get no such hint. Dario is her love, and we sense no regret from her about their relationship. As she reminisces about Marine, she recalls the moment Strong Belwas fell to his knees, heaving and shuddering before her flight. Danny, sharp as ever, has concluded that the locusts were poisoned, 
which, to her credit, reminds us that no matter how delirious and weakened she becomes, part of her mind is always trying to solve the problems she left behind in the city. She also believes the Yun Kai would have retreated after her flight, so the Battle of Fire is going to be news to her. With Tani in a feverish, exhausted state, it's a great opportunity for George to introduce an abstract element to Danny's thinking, in order to convey themes he might not be able to otherwise. Following an evening where she hears a mournful wolf howling far off, which might line up exactly with Jon Snow's assassination on the timeline, There's a morning where she is attacked by streams of ants who are marching over a wall. Some wonder if this could prefigure Danny one day arriving at the wall in northern Westeros to face off against the others. She wondered how the ants had managed to climb over it and find her. To them, these tumble-down stones must loom as huge as the wall of Westeros the biggest wall in all the world. George continues to wade into the abstract when Danny dreams. First of all, she dreams of Quaith, the enigmatic cryptic prophet whose motives remain a mystery to Danny and the reader alike. When Danny perceives Quaith, the mystic says, Remember who you are, Daenerys. The dragons know, do you? This brief exchange reminds us that Danny is on an inward journey in this chapter, and at risk of sounding cliché, needs to find herself in order to progress as a character. Danny's next dream is of Viserys. Viserys looked just as he had the last time she'd seen him. His mouth was twisted in anguish, his hair was burnt, and his face was black and smoking, where the molten gold had run down across his brow and cheeks and into his eyes. Here Danny enters into a conversation of sorts with her dead brother, and when she provides the opening gambit of, You're dead, she hears his reply, Murdered. The pair debate the treatment Viserys received, who is no more enlightened in death than he was in life, and the scene again functions as a recap. Another character important to Danny is Jorah Mormont, whom she expelled from Marine due to his duplicitous dealings with Robert's Iron Throne, putting her and her unborn son Rago in significant danger early in the story. Now the grass is talking to Danny with Jorah's voice, and he pleads his case for why she should move on from Marine and aim her sights firmly at Westeros. Like the dream of Viserys, Danny debates Jorah, and she understands both points of view. And when Jorah concludes with, You are the blood of the dragon, he could very well be answering Quaith's riddle that Daenerys needs to remember who she is. Fire and blood, responds Danny, and perhaps through this sequence of abstract scenes, Danny is realising who she is, a Targaryen. Targaryens don't plant trees, but they do conquer. Slowly, she seems to be warming to the idea that she must leave Marine behind to pursue her destiny. Let this city be, I said. Your war is in Westeros, I told you, says Jorah in response to Danny's realisation that Marine was not her home and never would be. Throughout these dreamy encounters, Danny is struggling to survive. And in one scene, she consumes green berries in desperation, which eventually make her ill. She is in danger, existing within an unforgiving landscape. At one stage, she notices that she's bleeding, and the audience is left to speculate whether this is truly her moon blood or a miscarriage, with much of the fandom preferring the latter interpretation. As she endeavours to follow a stream in the hope that one would lead to another, and eventually to the rolling Skahazadan river which runs adjacent to Marine, and with the Targaryen mantra, fire and blood, still ringing in her ears, she hears the bells of a Dothraki scout. She knows a Kalasar is near, and that they would not treat her kindly if they found her. So Danny hides in the grass. From a meta perspective, however, 
we as readers sense that this Kalasar could be her ticket out of this situation. Earlier, we mentioned that George had left a large hook at the end of the chapter to keep us excited for the winds of winter, and here it is. Danny summons Drogon, who takes her to a vast herd of horses and begins to feed. Danny joins him and must look a strange sight being so disheveled, feasting on charred horse meat alongside a dragon. Then comes the final line. That was how Carl Jaco found her when half a hundred mounted warriors emerged from the drifting smoke. Remembering that George was once a successful TV writer, where he attempted to keep the viewer immersed enough to not change the channel during ad breaks. And it was in TV writing that George became a master of what he calls act breaks, those plot hooks aimed at keeping viewers in suspense across a four or five act format. The most powerful act break, according to George in an interview with fellow author Jeff Vandermeer, is the cliffhanger. And with this closing scene, George delivers the perfect cliffhanger, which alongside the stabbing of Jon Snow, provides the audience with enough intrigue to be craving the winds of winter. There's a reason that so many of us have maintained our interest in Westeros during this long interim between volumes. This is addictive writing at its finest. So, altogether, Daenerys 10 functioned on various levels to give us a chapter that was at once part recap, part palate cleanser, part segue, and part sounding board for character development. Above all, it's a promise to the reader that Danny is changing, her situation is changing, and there will be some resolution to the conflict of her Dance with Dragons story. In The Winds of Winter, Danny will be approaching Marine from a different direction, both literally and metaphorically, and this chapter was essential in stripping her down, reevaluating her, and priming her for these changes. Once more, Danny proved beyond all doubt that she can survive and endure in the face of adversity. She's a character who's here to stay and one we should all be very excited about going forward. In the next section, we'll speculate on what comes next for Danny, from the immediate confrontation with Carl Jaco to Danny's control over Drogon to a possible sojourn to Vase Dorthrak. We have much to discuss as Danny seeks to empower herself once more following the weeks of lonely wandering marooned in the Dothraki Sea. Memories walked with her, clouds seen from above, horses small as ants thundering through the grass, a silver moon almost close enough to touch, rivers running bright and blue below, glimmering in the sun. Will I ever see such sights again? On Drogon's back, she felt whole. Up in the sky, the woes of this world could not touch her. How could she abandon that? As we heard in the last segment, the final cliffhanger in Daenerys Targaryen's A Dance with Dragon story sees Khal Jaco emerging from beyond the smoke with around 50 Dothraki warriors to find her feasting on burnt horse meat with Drogon, who is feasting nearby. With Danny sure to survive the situation somehow, given her importance to the present and future of the overall plot, we can begin to speculate on what comes next for her. And there are two separate eventualities we can envisage, so we're going to look at those potential paths in this segment. Although, first things first, let's have a brief recap of Cal Jaco in order to refamiliarize ourselves with a character last seen on page all the way back in A Game of Thrones. Every Kalasar has a leader, called a Kal, and every Kal has co-high-ranking commanders within the Kalasar. When a Kyle dies unexpectedly and without an obvious successor, their co sometimes fight between themselves to become the new Kyle, and in some cases, the Kylasar might split. This is exactly what happened in the case of Drogo and Kyle Jaco, as Jura Mormont explains here. 
Princess, hear me. The Dothraki will not follow a suckling babe. Drogo's strength was what they bowed to, and only that. When he is gone, Jaco and Pono and the other Kos will fight for his place, and this Kalasar will devour itself. The winner will want no more rivals. The boy will be taken from your breast the moment he is born. They will give him to the dogs. When Khal Drogo began to succumb to his illness, Jaco was the second of his co to defect and declare independence, after Pono, with both men declaring themselves as Khal. Jaco soon accepted Mago as his blood rider, and significantly for Danny, both men were involved in the rape and murder of Lazarine innocent Erewa, who Danny was invested in protecting, and whom she still thinks of into a dance with dragons. Be sure that Daenerys will not have forgiven nor forgotten this episode. Later in A Game of Thrones, we hear through Handmaiden Eerie that, quote, Jaco is a Carl now with 20,000 riders at his back. Evidently, Jaco's absconding was a success, and he's now a man of great power and a force to be reckoned with. At the same time, by re-emerging in the Dothraki Sea, Danny is beginning to fulfil Quaith's words of wisdom, to go forward, you must go back. Which brings us to two possible paths lying ahead of Danny as we enter the Winds of Winter. In one theory, Danny uses Drogon to perhaps kill her old enemy Jaco and then with the respect garnered in doing so, takes control of his riders and then his Kalasar before heading back to Vase Dothrak. The Dothraki might well be in awe of her if she can ride on Drogon's back and display her power as a dragon rider, given their reverence for riders is well established. However, another possibility is that Drogon is startled by proceedings and... Being an animal who has thus far proved to be unpredictable and barely controllable, leaves her side for the time being. Given the current state of weakness and her complete vulnerability without Drogon, Daenerys would then be at the mercy of Khal Jaco. Fortunately for her, however, Jaco might find himself bound by Dothraki tradition. In A Game of Thrones, we met the Dash Kaleen, a group of widows who were formerly married to Khals. The Dash Kaleen are respected and honored among the Dothraki. They present as wise crones who have the power to make major decisions from their home in Vase Dothrak, such as a say in the acceptance of Khals' new wives and the evaluation of prophecy. So in Daenerys 10 of A Dance with Dragons, George manages to remind us of this tradition, not once, but twice. First, we have this. Only the birth of her dragons amidst the fire and smoke of Khal Drogo's funeral pyre had spared Danny herself from being dragged back to Vase Dothrak to live out the remainder of her days amongst the crones of the Dosh Kaleen. And then there's this when Danny sees the Dothraki scout. If he found her there, he would kill her, rape her, or enslave her. At best, he would send her back to the crones of the Dosh Kaleen, where good Khaleesi were supposed to go when their Khals had died. With these timely reminders, and the fact that George included this tradition in his world building in the first place, it seems like Jaco forcing Danny back to Vase Dothrak to honour her fate as a Dosh Kaleen is a real possibility. The first objection to this scenario is that some readers find it hard to believe that Drogon would abandon Danny in her hour of need. She's bonded with the dragon to some extent at least, has journeyed far on his back, and is slowly learning to control him. And this is a fair point, we think, yet... We should remember that, ultimately, Drogon is an animal, and who knows how he thinks. Early on in Danny 10, we get this commentary on her control of the dragon. Sometimes it did not seem to matter where she struck him, though. Sometimes he went where he would and took her with him. Neither whip nor words could turn Drogon if he did not wish to be turned. 
It seems that sometimes Danny can guide Drogon where she wants to go, but she is still learning and he is yet to be sufficiently trained. Perhaps the most compelling evidence for this is the fact that a dance with dragons ends with Danny still wandering the Dothraki Sea, lost and dangerously close to peril. If she had even minimal control over Drogon, one would assume that she'd climb on his back and return to Marine. But he clearly has a mind of his own, and as such, a spontaneous flight from the situation does not seem impossible or a betrayal of George's setup. And of course, that doesn't mean he won't come back to aid her later in the story. One other factor we should consider when attempting to predict Danny's fate is the thematic layers George likes to imbue into his writing. If Danny is taken away by Cal Jaco, two vase Dothrak, bound and powerless, it would be a callback to her earlier story where she was married to Drogo and given no choice in the matter. After her time lost on the endless plains, being captured would put Danny at her lowest ebb and thus allow her to regain power and ultimately dominance in a gradual arc rather than happening almost too quickly. Both eventualities head the same way, with Danny eventually gathering the Dothraki people together, which we'll be getting to shortly, but we think that if the ascension is more of a struggle for Danny, then her glory will feel more earned and it might make better storytelling. So Danny being taken off forcibly to become one of the Dosh Kaleen ticks thematic and plot boxes that could serve to see Danny's power increasing on a gradient all through the Winds of Winter, from the initial disempowerment at the hands of Jaco to somehow turning Vase Dothrak on its head and uniting the various Dothraki Kalasars to invading Westeros with a vast devoted army. Danny's The Winds of Winter arc is poised to be one of the most exciting aspects of the novel, and as we said, George might not want to make things too easy for her initially. And regardless of what happens next for Danny in the early pages of The Winds of Winter, whether she subjugates Jaco's Kalasar or is taken captive by them, the notion of uniting the Dothraki as a major plot point is one we can talk fairly confidently about. This is largely because of the stallion that mounts the world prophecy. This is in fact the first prophecy presented to us in the series, mentioned initially in Danny's fourth chapter in A Game of Thrones. Jorah, who's acting as a cultural intermediary between Danny and the Dothraki, says this about Vase Dothrak. Only the crones of the Dosh Kaleen dwell permanently in the sacred city, them and their slaves and servants. Yet Vase Dothrak is large enough to house every man of every Kalasar, should all the Kals return to the mother at once. The crones have prophesied that one day that will come to pass, and so Vase Dothrak must be ready to embrace all its children. And later in Danny 5, Jura adds this. The stallion is the Karl of Karls promised in ancient prophecy, child. He will unite the Dothraki into a single Kalasar and ride to the ends of the earth, or so it was promised. And all the people of the world will be his herd. Before long, the Dosh Kaleen begin to believe that Danny's unborn child, Rago, will be the fulfillment of this ancient prophecy. Here's the passage. Finally the crone opened her eye and lifted her arms. I have seen his face and heard the thunder of his hooves, she proclaimed in a thin, wavery voice. The thunder of his hooves, the others chorused. As swift as the wind he rides, and behind him his kalasar covers the earth, men without number, with arrachs shining in their hands like blades of razor grass. Fierce as a storm this prince will be, his enemies will tremble before him, and their wives will weep tears of blood and rend their flesh in grief. The bells in his hair will sing his coming, and the milkmen in their stone tents will fear his name. The old woman trembled and looked at Danny almost as if she were afraid. 
The prince is riding, and he shall be the stallion who mounts the world. The stallion who mounts the world, the onlookers cried in echo, until the night rang to the sound of their voices. The one-eyed crone peered at Danny. What shall he be called, the stallion who mounts the world? Danny stood to answer. He shall be called Rago, she said, using the words that Jiki had taught her. Her hands touched the swell beneath her breast protectively as a roar went up from the Dothraki. Rago, they screamed. Rago, Rago, Rago. So we see with some sense of certainty that Dosh Kaleen have peered into their magical smoke and envisaged Rago becoming the prophesied figure. And in fact, after Rago's strange stillbirth, when Danny is at the house of the undying and under the influence of the curious hallucinogenic concoction known as the Shade of the Evening, she sees this image. A tall lord with copper skin and silver gold hair stood beneath the banner of a fiery stallion, a burning city behind him. The fandom consensus is that this vision is a morrow never made, a future that didn't happen, where Rago perhaps fulfills the prophecy and is shown here in all his violent power. However, soon Danny sees another Dothraki-related vision. It says, Beneath the Mother of Mountains, a line of naked crones crept from a great lake and knelt shivering before her, their grey heads bowed. Now this could very well be a glimpse of Danny, one way or another fulfilling the stallion who mounts the world prophecy, which, if true, would no doubt occur in the upcoming novel. The Dosh Kaleen seems central to the legitimacy of the prophecy, and so earning the deferential, head-bowing approval of the crones might signify that Danny has been accepted by them as the prophesied figure. How this would all come about remains to be seen. Is Danny the stallion, or perhaps the stallion's rider? As Danny's mount, and therefore analogous to a Kyle's stallion, Drogon would surely impress the equine culture of the Dothraki as being extremely powerful and worthy of respect. Yet perhaps we shouldn't expect Drogon to simply swoop in and bail her out in a sort of rerun of what happened at Daznak's pit. Perhaps Danny doesn't need rescuing and instead will use her acumen and force of will to elevate herself out of trouble and into a position of power as she's done before. This, we think, would be far more gratifying for the reader. If the stallion who mounts the world prophecy is somehow realised in Daenerys and Drogon, it would surely be a typically fist-pumping occasion, the sort we have experienced several times in her story. But we should be cautious about what the prophecy actually means. Prophesied figures have been the subject of many fantasy series, and becoming messianic is not always good news for a character. There are cautionary tales against messiah figures in other well-known sagas, and when we actually look at what's said about the prophecy in story, there is reason for concern. Yeah, recall the line, his enemies will tremble before him and their wives will weep tears of blood and rend their flesh in grief. This prophecy is on the one hand about someone uniting the tribes, and on the other, using that consolidated power to destroy enemies. It is not the prophecy of a savior, but one of inevitable violence. Ultimately, if Daenerys is to collect the Dothraki into one giant legion and uproot them from their home in Essos... She bears great responsibility for leading an entire people to a new land and for ensuring that some of their worst cultural habits are kept at bay when in Westeros. In other words, protecting the people there that she would rule over from her adopted clan. Cal Jaco is a known rapist, murderer, and enslaver who Danny has every reason to despise, and her treatment of him in The Winds of Winter, where we think he'll eventually be brought to justice for his crimes against Erowet, could denote that Danny will not tolerate such atrocities from the Dothraki a moment longer, especially when they come to represent her on the battlefield. But with so much responsibility resting upon her young shoulders, with the dichotomy in her mind between her tremendous empathy for the downtrodden and her thirst for conquest, many readers have brought into question Danny's state of mind. 
in Meereen, she was alienated and felt the enormous burden of ruling a deeply troubled city, and in the Dothraki Sea, she became delirious and unwell. Both of these responses seem reasonable given the circumstances. However, Barristan Selmy told Danny in A Storm of Swords that... I am no maester to quote history at you, your grace. Swords have been my life, not books. But every child knows that the Targaryens have always danced too close to madness. Your father was not the first. King Jaehaerys once told me that madness and greatness are two sides of the same coin. Every time a new Targaryen is born, he said, the gods toss the coin in the air and the world holds its breath to see how it will land. With the infamous decline of Danny's father, Ares, known widely as the Mad King, and the fact that the descent into madness is a classic narrative trope and arc explored by writers of such prowess as William Shakespeare, readers have long wondered which way Danny's coin will fall. Thus, Danny's inner world is something we should pay close attention to in The Winds of Winter. That said, expect a positive arc from Danny's point of view in the upcoming novel, one that's poised to deliver the moment many of us have been waiting for, Danny returning to Westeros on a war footing, which we'll discuss later in the episode. Next up, though, we have lots to say about the plethora of potential intersections awaiting Danny on her return to Marine. So let's take a look at what and who she might be returning to when she reemerges in Slaver's Bay. But first, Radio Westeros is powered by patrons, and our sincere thanks go to our Valyrian Steel level patrons. Sir Tim of House Jib Jab Hot Dog Shop. House motto, we forge the chains we wear in life. Aerodo, Aileen, Akiva of House Hunt, Oxheart, Amber the Adamant, Anna, Hortense of Ashai, Blythe Spirit, Cabeth the Unfrozen, Christian, Marge of the Mage, David, Dean, Dibbles and Bits, Drew, Eliana Targaryen, Sir Sorcedelica, James K, Lord Sosa and his faithful canine companion Theoden, Jill, Miss Jody, J.M., Herbert Westeros, the Miskatonic Maester, Juna of House Aiko, Casey, screenwriter Catherine Van Pelt, Lady of the Frostfangs, Lady Silverwing, Infanderis the Unspeakable Terror, Liam, Boss, The Sithorian, Sally, Tristis Lurian, Wild Child of the Wolfswood, W, Sword of the Evening, and Lady Diarlis of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. The glass candles are burning. Soon comes the pale mare, and after her the others. Kraken in dark flame, Lion and Griffin, the sun's son, and the mummer's dragon. Trust none of them. Remember the undying. Beware the perfumed seneschal. So far, we've recapped Daenerys' story through her time in Slaver's Bay, focused on a chapter stranded in the Dothraki Sea, and speculated as to what comes next for her in the immediate future. With some confidence, we've concluded that Danny will, one way or another, be taken back to Vase Dothrak, and that she's destined to unite the Dothraki to her cause before transporting her massive army to Westeros, as she seeks to invade and ultimately win the Iron Throne for herself. However, what's less certain is what happens in between when she revisits Marine with a massive host of Dothraki warriors at her back and a long line of characters vying for her attention. Armies are difficult to feed at the best of times, and we know that there are food shortages in Marine, so it seems likely there will be enormous pressure on Danny to resolve her politics in the city and leave Marine behind as stable as possible and as soon as possible. And aside from those paramount decisions, as we've said, Danny will also have to deal with a large cast of characters waiting for her to re-emerge in the city. These interactions will tell us a lot about Danny's new hierarchy and expect lots of relationships and dynamics to change as Danny turns from ruler to invader. So let's look at the characters Danny might be intersecting with in The Winds of Winter, recap shared histories, and speculate as to what direction these relationships are headed. 
And why don't we begin with those characters already familiar to her who have been waiting in and around Maureen in the hope that she might soon return after the events of Daznak's Pit. First up, it's Dario Naharis. Draw your sword and swear it to my service. My sword is yours. My life is yours. My love is yours. My blood, my body, my songs, you own them all. I live and die at your command, fair queen. In A Dance with Dragons, the budding romance with Dario provides Danny with some excitement as a counterpoint to the dense power struggle and endless problems attached to leading Marine. These dynamics allow Danny to fantasize and feel loved. She is a teenage girl, after all. In practical terms, Dario's bad boy nature might be thrilling for Danny, but he offers nothing in terms of political clout, and Barristan judges him to be a distraction to Danny's cause. And sure enough, Danny ultimately weds his Darzo Lorak for political reasons, despite her daydream that the Seltzord might swoop in at the last moment and abscond with her. Dario is then taken by the Yunkai as a hostage to guarantee Marine keeps the peace. While Dario seems at risk during the outbreak of the Battle of Fire, we learn that Baristan is attempting to free Danny's hostages by promising the tattered prince Pentos if he delivers them safely. We think Dario has a decent chance of returning to Marine, in which case Danny might have a difficult decision to make. We expect her to return with a renewed sense of purpose, and her ambition to conquer Westeros more than likely means that she's going to have to leave Dario behind, and that is both from an in-story and a meta perspective. How Dario is going to react to such a rejection is really anyone's guess. And a similar decision could also have to be made about Danny's husband, his Darzo Lorak. Before you came, Marine was dying. Our rulers were old men with withered cocks and crones whose puckered cunts were dry as dust. They sat atop their pyramids sipping apricot wine and talking of the glories of the old empire while the centuries slipped by and the very bricks of the city crumbled all around them. Custom and caution had an iron grip upon us till you awakened us with fire and blood. A new time has come and new things are possible. Danny married Hisdar in order to establish peace in Marine, and there was no genuine love between them. The marriage came with clauses, leading to Danny's dismay at compromising beliefs and standards that she had hoped would transform the region towards a new era of liberation. Since Danny disappeared on Drogon's back, Hisdar has attempted to assert control over the city. However, the Shavepate convinced Barristan to arrest Hisdar under the suspicion of poisoning the locusts. The burning question, when considering what sort of future the man now has with Daenerys, is will he survive long enough to meet her? With the Battle of Fire raging outside the city, and Barristan dedicated to leading the defense, Hisdar has become a vulnerable figure. And Hisdar is also vulnerable in a meta-storytelling sense. As we alluded to in the segment on Dario, Danny must seek new alliances in Westeros if her invasion is to be successful. George might want his da out of the way by then, and he's hardly an asset to her long game goals. Perhaps the cleanest way George could remove his da from the story would be to have him killed before Danny's return, giving her the freedom to be matched with and to love new characters soon to arrive in her story. And with the Shavepate, who may or may not be involved with deep-rooted political scheming still in the city, one possibility is that when the dust has settled after the Battle of Fire, Barristan returns to the city to find Hisdar has been executed at the hands of Skahaz. That's one possibility for Hisdar's demise, although not by any means the only option. But if Hisdar does survive and is alive when Daenerys returns she will have to find a way to leave him behind. Again, 
killing him herself is not out of the question if she judges him to have betrayed her in any way, such as if she concludes that he poisoned the locusts. Alternatively, she might seek to annul the marriage more peacefully and perhaps give him some remaining power over the city following her departure. One thing we think is certain is that his Darzo Lorak will not be on the ship to Westeros and that Danny will be rid of him one way or another. And with the discussion on Dario and Hisdar fresh in our minds, let's consider the potential reacquaintance between Danny and the man attempting to speak with her words following her flight from the city, Barristan Selmy. I am no hand. I am only a simple knight, the Queen's protector. I never wanted this. But with the Queen gone and the King in chains, someone had to rule, and Sir Barristan did not trust the shave pate. As we heard in that quote, and as we discussed in our primer episode concerning Barristan and Maureen, the old knight found himself straining under the weight of his newfound responsibility of guarding Danny's interests, a fish out of water in a city which had already provided him with a desperate sense of alienation. He is, at heart, a simple man cut out for the service and protection required of the king's guard. Now he finds himself, as lost as his queen, simply hanging on to the thread of hope that she might soon return to power. Baristan's inadequacy in leading on behalf of Daenerys is made plain in the latter pages of A Dance with Dragons, although we can be sure that he's trying hard to maintain her values. However, before long, we see that Skahaz has his attention, and that some of the decisions Baristan is making are beyond the remit of his authority, arguably made from a place where he is no longer channeling Danny's voice. The prime example is the arrest of Hisdar, where Barristan puts all his faith in the Shavepate, a man who he has already thought of as untrustworthy. Where this plot thread leads remains to be seen, but we get the sense that trouble could be brewing for Hisdar, effectively under Barristan's authority. With the advent of the Battle of Fire, we do see a change in Barristan as he feels naturally at home in a battle setting. He's been training young fighters in the hope of providing Danny with a valuable legacy and has now knighted Tumko Lo, Larak, and the Red Lamb. He's leading the charge against the Yunkai and has made the crucial decision to attack the enemy in the field rather than hide behind the city walls as diseased bodies are flung inside by the trebuchets. We can be more confident of Barristan's martial decision than of his in-city political maneuvers. When Danny finally reunites with Barristan, she will have to hear of both the political and military decisions taken in her stead. She might be less than impressed by the arrest of Hisdar, although we can't say with any degree of certainty how she'll react there. However, if the city is defended effectively and the Yunkish force is defeated, Danny will surely be reassured as to Barristan's worth as a seasoned military leader and commander who could prove to be invaluable to her on the battlefields of Westeros. Perhaps what might be more interesting is Barristan's reaction to Danny. If she has an innumerable Dothraki horde at her back and is preaching fire and blood with renewed aggression, what will the chivalrous Barristan make of it? Will he embrace a position of authority over such diverse forces, or will he worry that he's bringing unfettered carnage and violence to Westeros, a barbarian horde whom he might assume will fight with dishonor? Could his dedication to Danny waver in any way? Expect the friction between Barristan's internal conflict of honor versus duty to continue in the winds of winter, and how he reacts to Danny's return should be very interesting, especially if we continue to be privy to his point of view. And aside from Dario, Hisdar, and Barristan, there are other notable characters from or within Marine who are important to Daenerys in one way or the other. Her reaction to Skahaz or Reznak Mo Reznak all depend on what happens within the city walls during the Battle of Fire. 
there are so many potential eventualities here, so many ideas and theories purported by the fandom, it's difficult to predict what a reunion with such characters will look like. Danny might choose to execute those who have betrayed her in some way, such as the character Danny judges to have poisoned the locusts, or whoever is proven to be the harpy, so potential culprits such as Gehaz or the Green Grace should beware. However, we should keep in mind that Danny needs to install some form of governing body before she sails west. Leaders who will rule with her vision of a slaveless bay. When the dust settles, there must be local characters of note who Danny trusts enough to hand over the reins of power to if we're to witness a clean and decent succession. One idea we've had along these lines is the potential for leaving someone like the tattered prince in charge. A nobleman, evidently judged worthy of leadership by his fellow Pentashi many years ago, he's been promised Pentos by Barristan as the price of his cooperation with the hostages and the battle. But we've said before that we think this will be a difficult promise for Barristan to fulfill when Danny returns. The elegant solution for someone who owes a man a city, and is in search of a ruler for another city, would be to combine the two. Time will tell, of course, but if Danny and George seek to kill two birds with one stone, we think this could be a possibility. And then there are two characters Danny is quite fond of and will be anxious to reunite with. Miss Ande is a young and talented scribe, translator and herald, who had a valuable place by Danny's side. We hope that Miss Ande remains safe within the Great Pyramid, given there is a high chance of danger within the city. We've speculated that she might be guarded by strong Belwas, who is on the road to recovery following his close brush with death after consuming a large amount of poisoned locusts. We take the fact that George chose him to survive the ordeal as encouraging that he has a future in the story, and all told, both Miss Andai and Strong Belwas could be valuable assets for Danny in the Westerosi invasion although there is a chance she leaves strong Belwes behind. Either way, she'll no doubt be delighted to speak to them both, especially Miss Ande, who, being so young and innocent, Danny must feel protective of. Now that we've covered Danny's potential renewed acquaintance with those characters she left in and around Marine, let's turn our gaze to the selection of characters headed to the city who hope to one day meet her, this is Danny's chance, and George's chance, to freshen up Danny's story and leave Maureen behind in more ways than one. We've likened it to Danny swapping out her team, refining her hierarchy as she makes ready to strike forth to Westeros, and she'll need to make quick decisions regarding who to take and what their roles would be going forward. And why don't we begin with a character who left her employ and now hopes to return to the fold? Jorah Mormont. I had to take Marine to feed my people. You took Marine, yet still you lingered. To be a queen. You are a queen in Westeros. It is such a long way. I was tired, Jorah. I was weary of war. I wanted to rest, to laugh, to plant trees and see them grow. I'm only a young girl. No. You are the blood of the dragon. Dragons plant no trees. Remember that. Remember who you are and what you were made to be. Remember your words. Fire and blood. Jura Mormont shares history with Daenerys, going back all the way to Pentos. He was with her and her brother in their days at Illyrio's Mance. He rode with Drogo's Kalasar through the Dothraki Sea, crossed the blazing heat of the Red Waste to Carth, and was by her side when she tore through Slaver's Bay. All this made the revelation of his betrayal the more painful for her. Jorah confessed to spying on Danny in A Storm of Swords after the emergence of Barristan Selmy as a witness to his duplicity, proved that in George's world, it's difficult to escape from one's past. 
Once exiled from Westeros by Ned Stark for selling poachers into slavery, Jorah found himself, likewise, banished from Danny's orbit. He claims to be in love with her, and following his departure from her company, he became a desperate man. Before long, he himself was sold into slavery after being captured while trying to deliver Tyrion Lannister to Danny, and at that point, lovesick and lost, he gave up on himself and was branded with the mark of a troublesome slave on his face. Following Danny's decision to part with Jorah, the thought of him made her angry and confused. However, fate has brought Jorah back to Marine's doorstep, and it's a fair bet that the pair will be reunited before long. Whereas the old Danny might have been firm with her decision to expel him from her company, her flight away from the city into the introspective world of the Dothraki Sea means her values are being challenged and she is experiencing a certain nostalgia for the friends she's lost. Not only is she missing Jiki and Eerie and sweet Miss Ande, but Jura too. The fact that as she wonders she dreams deliriously about Jura highlights his continuing importance to her and the fact that although her actions were justified, she feels some remorse over his departure. The voice was no more than a whisper, yet somehow Danny felt he was walking just behind her. My bear, she thought, my old sweet bear, who loved me and betrayed me. She had missed him so. She wanted to see his ugly face, to wrap her arms around him and press herself against his chest. But she knew that if she turned around, Sir Jura would be gone. With Danny's priorities about to change as she seeks to escape the Dothraki Sea and eventually set her sights on Westeros, we can wonder if Jorah's new proximity to Meereen means that upon her return the two will reacquaint and that she might forgive him. She could perceive that following his recent suffering, enslavement, and branding, Jorah has paid his pound of flesh, so to speak, and she might want to keep her early promise of delivering him home after a triumphant campaign in Westeros. The short of it is that Danny's invasion stands a higher chance of success if she surrounds herself with advisors who have experience in Westeros. Tyrion, Barristan, and Jorah could all play key roles for her. What's the use in transporting a huge Kalisar and thousands of Unsullied and possibly other associate soldiers if she doesn't know the lay of the land? If Danny is to maneuver from ruler to invader to ruler, perhaps she'll be more ready to forgive past wrongs by those who would be loyal to her in that effort. And if this is the case, Jorah must manifest his love to her by fealty rather than seeking to steal kisses. To put it bluntly, if he's to be by her side once more, he needs to grow up. And speaking of potential advisors, we mentioned another Westerosi man, one she has yet to meet, that Danny might benefit from the company of. Tyrion Lannister is trying his best to survive enslavement and war, and could soon cross paths with Danny. I know that she spent her childhood in exile, impoverished, living on dreams and schemes, running from one city to the next, always fearful, never safe, friendless, but for a brother who is by all accounts half mad. A brother who sold her maidenhood to the Dothraki for the promise of an army. I know that somewhere upon the grass her dragons hatched and so did she. I know she is proud, how not? What else was left but her pride? I know she is strong, how not? The Dothraki despise weakness. If Daenerys had been weak, she would have perished with Viserys. I know she is fierce. Astapor, Yunkai and Marine are proof enough of that. She has survived assassins and conspiracies and fell sorceries, grieved for a brother and a husband and a son, trod the cities of the slavers to dust beneath her dainty sandaled feet. While Jorah and Barristan make fine advisors for the most part, neither are men you'd call cunning, 
And cunning might be exactly what Daenerys needs if she's to mount a successful attack on the Iron Throne. During the Battle of the Blackwater, we witnessed Tyrion Lannister defend the city using not only cunning, but a level of ingenuity not often seen in the story, even among seasoned commanders. The wildfire plot and the giant chain were extremely effective in the defeat of Stannis Baratheon, and his tenure as hand to Joffrey was a success before he was ignominiously brought down to earth by his father. Tyrion has since murdered said father, strangled his girlfriend, fallen out with his brother Jamie, and is the subject of a worldwide dwarf dragnet instigated by his sister Cersei. To say that Tyrion is troubled would be an understatement, and throughout A Dance with Dragons, his fortunes continue to spiral down, and as a slave, he narrowly avoids being eaten alive by lions for the amusement of the crowd. Readers will be hoping that after hitting rock bottom, Tyrion can somehow rebound on an upward swinging arc during the Winds of Winter. But Tyrion needs a stroke of fortune in order to lift himself out of the perpetual internal and external suffering he's become accustomed to, and the most likely way for that to happen is for him to find himself in Danny's company. A meeting between these two would be very interesting indeed. Both are major characters in the saga and have made successful military decisions. However, Danny is likely to be suspicious of Tyrion initially, given her view of the history the Targaryens have had with the Lannisters, as demonstrated by this exchange with Barristan. Have you forgotten Princess Rhaenys and Prince Aegon? Never. That was Lannister work, your grace. Lannister or Stark, what difference... Viserys used to call them the usurper's dog. If a child is set upon by a pack of hounds, does it matter which one tears out his throat? All the dogs are just as guilty. Yet, as we've highlighted, neither is Tyrion a fan of House Lannister. In spite of his name, the pair have that much in common, and if Daenerys recognises that Tyrion's thirst for vengeance and validation could work in her favour, she will surely begin to see his potential as a chief advisor and strategist who could offer a different sort of wisdom in the upper echelons of her hierarchy. Daenerys and Tyrion are both highly intelligent, and they should realise the potential in teaming up with a shared vision and common cause. Tyrion cannot expect to be evaluated instantly upon meeting her, and must find ways to convey his gift as a strategist, but we have little doubt that with his sharp and manipulative mind, he'll find a way to fall into her favour. One way he is sure to impress her is with his knowledge of dragons, which is well documented throughout his POV chapters. The truth is that Danny birthed the dragons with pure instinct, and her dearth of experience on the subject has meant that, at times, they have been a liability. With Tyrion's knowledge, Danny might finally be able to harness the true potential of her dragons as she seeks to dominate the battlefields of Westeros. The potential meeting between these two characters could be refreshing for both of them, reinvigorating their sense of ambition and purpose while exciting the reader. For these reasons, this is one of the most hotly anticipated intersections of the Winds of Winter. And if Tyrion's arrival in Marine is going to be a surprise for Danny, it's certainly not what he intended either. But there are characters who have travelled far and wide to meet her, some of whom want to aid her cause. Which brings us to another potential encounter. In A Feast for Crows, we meet Marwyn the Mage at the Citadel, and he wants to be by Danny's side too. Tell me all you told our Dornish Sphinx. I know much of it and more, but some small parts may have escaped my notice. He was not a man to be refused. Sam hesitated a moment, then told his tale again as Marwyn, Alaris, and the other novice listened. Maester Aemon believed that Daenerys Targaryen was the fulfillment of a prophecy. Her, not Stannis, nor Prince Rhaegar, nor the princeling whose head was dashed against the wall. 
through the books, George slips in snippets of information about Marwin which serve to create a mystical aura about the man, such as the mention of his time teaching Miri Mazdur in Essos. In Feast, we finally meet him on page. Upon hearing from Samwell that Maester Aemon believed Daenerys to be the fulfilment of ancient prophecy before his death, and in spite of a noted scepticism regarding such prophecies, Marwyn drops everything to set off on a journey east on Cinnamon Wind to be by Danny's side. We mentioned that Tyrion has a lot to offer Danny that her other advisors might not, and the same can be said about Marwyn. Not only can he counsel her on matters of prophecy and the more mystical aspects of her encounters, but he's also an archmaester of the Citadel who could offer his expertise on any number of other, more pragmatic subjects, which could be essential when leading a gigantic host to war. It should be noted that Aegon is also invading Westeros with a maester, albeit a half-maester, by his side. Danny would be remiss in neglecting to employ a similar figure. And what happens next with Marwyn really depends on if he makes it to Marine. Readers note that the waters outside Old Town are dangerous with reeving Ironborn patrolling the coast. It is possible that in Marwyn's haste he made a poor decision to sail through the danger and could find himself in trouble. However, it should be noted that when George has discussed the Miranese knot and his difficulties in deciding what order characters will arrive in Marine first, he did mention Marwyn as one of those characters. And so, if Marwyn does make it past the Ironborn and through the waters out of Old Town and is successful in his mission to meet Daenerys, she could find great value in employing him as a maester. With the Red Priest Benero preaching, rightly or not, that Daenerys is Azor Ahai reborn, prophecy is an aspect of her story that's about to come to the fore. As such, Marwyn might offer invaluable advice and bring the looming specter of the others to Danny's attention. Think Davos inspiring Stannis to sail north, therefore setting up the longer-term plot. A meeting between these two in the Winds of Winter would be intriguing, given George's reluctance to give Marwyn too much page time thus far, and we'd be very excited to see him plead his case as to what he could offer her. So, we look forward to seeing Marwyn and Danny intersect, and we think we can safely label him as a wildcard character. So far, we've discussed how Danny could soon find herself in Marine with her diverse army gathered together on a war footing, with a new hierarchy of advisors and with the burning ambition to strike west. But, in order to transport her enormous entourage across the open ocean, she needs ships. So let's consider Victorian Greyjoy. Victorian drank with the rest. There is no wine so sweet as wine taken from a foe. Someone had told him that once. His father, or his brother Balon. One day I shall drink your wine, Crow's Eye, and take from you all that you hold dear. When Euron Greyjoy turned up in the Iron Isles under suspicious circumstances and subsequently won the King's Moot, he promised much and more to the Ironborn. One aspect of his pitch included the claim that he would gain power over dragons in order to elevate the Ironborn to a position of great power, and so Euron aimed to meet with Daenerys. You'd think that such an important mission would require Euron himself to make that voyage, which seems to have been his initial plan. Yet, he pivots and sends his brother Victarion to do his bidding instead, providing him with the mysterious dragon horn that we saw being blown on Old Wick. Victarion accepts the mission and heads east with the Iron Fleet. The Iron Captain clearly has designs to take Danny for himself, partly in revenge for Euron's one-time seduction of his wife, although the reader can't help but wonder if Victarion is being set up somehow. Either way, Victarion sails to Slaver's Bay, persevering when the Iron Fleet becomes scattered, 
picking up any vessel he can find to compensate and listening to the counsel of his mystical guide, Makoro. Makoro possesses uncanny prophetic abilities related to the Red God, and after cauterizing Victarion's infected hand with dark magic, the pair begin to consider the upcoming role of the Hellhorn. We know from the sample chapters that Victarion will be arriving outside of Marine on a war footing, but the mechanics of the horn, poised to be blown in the vicinity of two circling dragons, remains a mystery. What happens with the horn will have a huge bearing on how Danny receives Victarion and Makoro, so it's difficult to predict how such an introduction might play out. With that said, and if Victarion does meet Danny, we must first consider that Vic has travelled a long way and carries in him a sort of brutish arrogance. He knows little about her, and some of his behaviour that we bear witness to through his POV, such as the ceremonious burning of innocent slaves for favours from the gods, is likely to disgust Danny, as is his bizarre smoking hand. On the other hand, he's delivering a fleet in order to facilitate her migration to Westeros, which is likely to be essential to her eventual plans, although he fully expects her hand in marriage in return. Even if his dar is removed from the equation, Danny's hardly likely to marry Victarion. As such, an intersection between these two would be extremely interesting to read, given the conflict this awkward situation lends itself to. Victarion is strong-willed, yet Theon Greyjoy describes him as like some great grey bullock, strong and tireless and dutiful, but not like to win any races. How these traits will affect the potential meeting with Danny remains to be seen, but with Makoro's vision of Euron puppeteering him, one of several ominous signs, and with Danny being nobody's fool in general, Victarion needs to keep his wits about him in order to survive. And, as we said, a lot rides on what happens with the Dragonhorn, given that trying to wrest control of her dragons is hardly the best way to introduce yourself to the Mother of Dragons. Which brings us to Makoro. Someone told me that the night is dark and full of terrors. What do you see in those flames? Dragons, Makoro said in the common tongue of Westeros. Although in this quote, it seems like Makoro is explicitly referring to metaphorical Targaryen dragons, his purpose seems strongly connected to the two actual dragons circling over Marine as the Yunkish army launches dead bodies into the air from their trebuchets, perhaps not realizing the danger inherent in doing so. As we said, Makoro's reception in Marine, if he ever gets to meet Danny in person, is tied to the dragon horn and those dragons. Makoro has been sent by High Priest of R'hllor, Benero, who has himself been preaching his belief that Daenerys is the fulfilment of ancient prophecy to eager listeners in Volantis. Benero wants Makoro to provide Dany with wise counsel and help guide her towards some grand destiny. The Black Flame possesses a prescience accurate to a degree not witnessed elsewhere in the novels, and so it's likely that Makoro has a good idea of what lies ahead of him, as he did when he was floating in the sea for ten days after departing the Selasori Koran. With mystical powers at his disposal, Makoro soon takes an interest in the dragon's horn and deciphers the ancient glyphs upon it. With Victarion eager to use the horn, Makoro's the one who seems to understand its magic, and so we readers wait with bated breath to see how events unfold in the near future. If Makoro one day meets Danny and Marine, will she be impressed by his antics? And will she see his potential as an ally given his remarkable ability to read the future? At the least, Makoro will represent the growing number of R'hllor fanatics awakening to the notion that Danny is the fulfillment of a savior prophecy, and although she should absorb that claim with caution, who knows how it might affect her actions. 
With all this said, one thing to consider is Makoro's greater role in the story. Does George really want to give a tight focus and longevity to a character who has such mastery of mysterious powers? Does the fact Makoro is so adept at magic mean that he will be swept off our pages before too long? It's certainly possible that Makoro does not live to meet Danny, and we can't help but notice he is described as being large and barrel chested of a similar build to the unfortunate soul who blew the horn at the King's Moot. Could Makoro blow the horn and sacrifice himself whilst bringing the dragons under control? All of this remains to be seen, but consider the fact that Makoro could give that horn one hell of a toot if he so desired. Finally, we have to consider a character who's been present in Danny's point of view since A Clash of Kings. Quaith was one of the envoys who came from Karth to meet Danny and her newly hatched dragons in Veas Toloro, and was last seen in person in Karth giving Danny this advice. You must leave this city soon, Daenerys Targaryen, or you will never be permitted to leave it at all. To go north, you must journey south. To reach the west, you must go east. To go forward, you must go back. To touch the light, you must pass beneath the shadow. Quaith has appeared again to Danny three times, once aboard Balerion as they travelled towards Slaver's Bay, once in Danny's garden in Marine, and again as she wandered the Dothraki Sea. Each time she apparently used some magical means of communication and has delivered cryptic warnings and advice, but it's her words in Karth that are immediately compelling for the literal direction of Danny's Winds of Winter arc the metaphorical idea of going backwards in order to proceed in the direction of her destiny could certainly be fulfilled by Danny returning to Vaes Dothrak as a captive, not to mention Vaes Dothrak is quite literally east of her current location and from her intended destination. Add to this that Quaith's warnings are clearly intended to nudge Danny's character in a specific direction, remember who you are, Daenerys Targaryen, and influence her reactions to a number of other characters, trust none of them, and we'd be remiss not to wonder what role Quaith plays in Danny's Winds of Winter arc, whether in person or by mystical means. There's no doubt George has his hands full in trying to coordinate Danny's interactions in the Winds of Winter. She's a character in high demand, who's turned Marine into a nexus of intersections. Given the words of Quaith that we just referred to, trust none of them, it remains to be seen how she'll react to the newcomers, while the baggage of the recent past might impact these reunions. All of this serves to outline what an important character she is to this story as she gears up to finally take her tilt at Westeros. And that will be the subject of our next segment. I am sworn to serve your grace, and to keep you safe from harm wherever you may go. My place is by your side, whether here or in King's Landing, but your place is back in Westeros, upon the Iron Throne that was your father's. As it stands now, Daenerys is lost in the Dothraki Sea, and we think one way or another she's likely to soon find herself back at Vaes Dothrak. From there, she must initiate change internally and externally, and ascend to a position where the Kalisars will unite under her banner and agree to fight her war in Westeros. Afraid of any water that horses don't drink, the Dothraki will take some convincing, and this journey of empowerment before she returns to Marine will likely take up the early parts of her Winds of Winter story. When Danny does finally arrive in Marine, probably with an unspeakably large host of Dothraki riders with her, she will need to make a series of quick decisions regarding the future of the city and deal with the many characters eager to meet her. 
But in order to launch a successful invasion of Westeros, she is going to have to plan the long, complicated journey before too long, lest she remain in Slaver's Bay forever. Danny will need to decide who to take with her and who to leave in Marine to rule the city in her name and with her revolutionary ethos. While there are characters like Tyrion Lannister, who would no doubt be of great use to her in the near future, as we mentioned, there are those who she somehow needs to shed in order to move forward, people like Dario Naharis and his Darzo Lorak. When she's decided on her personnel, who her new team is, and their ranks and purpose to her grand scheme, she'll next need to consider transportation. Danny's army, containing Unsullied, the Dothraki, and whatever sellswords she chooses to enlist, will be enormous. Fortunately for her, there are two large fleets set to arrive outside of Marine in the early pages of the Winds of Winter. The sample chapters offer confirmation that Victarion's Iron Fleet have arrived and his men are engaged in attacking the Junkish army, with the Iron Captain seeking to aid Danny and ultimately gain enough approval to take her hand in marriage, an offer which she's likely to spurn. It's difficult to say how this conflict of wills will be resolved, but if Danny does end up making use of that fleet, she will be going some way to accomplishing her voyage. The Iron Fleet, remembering that while many vessels were lost on the journey to Slaver's Bay, others were gained by force, numbered 61 ships as they sailed into Marine. Considering the vast size of Danny's army in our predictions, she might need additional transport. Enter the Volantine fleet that's currently headed for Marine, ostensibly in support of the Yunkai, who are waiting for their arrival to bolster their numbers and turn the tide of war. The Volantine government has declared war on Daenerys, and their fleet could number as many as 500 ships, quite an astounding number. However, we see in both Tyrion and Victarion's viewpoints that the political climate in Volantis has grown complex. Most notable is the exposition given to the priest Benero, who is proclaiming Danny, rightly or wrongly, to be Azor High reborn. The problem that the Volantine leaders now have is that four out of every five Volantine citizens are slaves and have good cause to support Daenerys, the breaker of chains. Add on to that wave of religious devotion encouraged by Bonero and directed towards Danny, designed to appeal to slaves who are mostly devotees of the Red God, and you have a recipe for revolution. We only have to look at the High Sparrow in King's Landing to see how much of a mark one inspired preacher can make. So, with as many as 500 ships headed to Marine, crewed by slaves, there's good reason to believe that with moments like the Widow of the Waterfront asking Jorah Mormont to relay a message to Danny, tell her we're waiting, tell her to come soon, George has laid some not-so-subtle groundwork for the notion that the Volantine slaves are primed to revolt. With Bonero's agent Makoro perhaps waiting to greet them in Marine, many believe that rather than coming to the rescue of the Yunkish army, the Volantines will join the fray for Marine. Thus, Danny could find herself with another large, willing fleet at her disposal. Whether Danny will visit Volantis en route to Westeros remains to be seen, but it's not beyond the realms of possibility that she adds it to her travel itinerary and makes a stop there amid a slave uprising. It would certainly be good to see Danny's ethos being embraced by the slaves themselves. While we wouldn't expect Danny to stay in Volantis for too long, she could use it as a resupplying call and perhaps meet Bonero to discuss her wider purpose as he sees it. With Marwyn perhaps joined to Danny's cause by then, George must begin to provide Danny with snippets of information regarding the imminent invasion of Westeros by the others if he is to set up an eventual showdown between them. First Makoro, and then Benero could fit the bill. 
and whether or not Danny does find herself in Volantis, one of the most important decisions she's going to have to make is where to land in Westeros when she finally arrives. We've seen many debates about this over the years, with suggestions that she might choose to disembark in Dorne, the Vale, the North, or near King's Landing itself. However, none of these eventualities hold as much thematic weight as the notion that she could land at Dragonstone, the ancient and historic Targaryen seat, which happens to be rather vulnerable due to the ongoing struggle between Stannis Baratheon's remaining troops and the Crown's forces led by Loras Tyrell. First of all, Dragonstone is where Daenerys was born, so it would be rather fitting if she was to return to the island some 16 years later, seeking to reclaim what she believes to be her birthright. Danny seems to know very little about her early life, and rarely contemplates her mother, Rhaella, who died birthing her, and so revisiting Dragonstone could provide us with a setting of great personal resonance. In fact, when Danny is lost in the Dothraki Sea, the chapter opens with her naming a local hill, which Drogon has made into his lair, Dragonstone. But Danny choosing to land at Dragonstone would provide further thematic depth. The fortress was once used by none other than Aegon the Conqueror, who planned his invasion of Westeros from its heights. Danny, of course, is seeking to emulate Aegon, and having her act similarly to her ancestor would surely make the story more satisfying as the past and the present become bound together in parallel. And aside from the nostalgia and the echoes from the past, Dragonstone in itself is a strong citadel capable of housing thousands of troops and harbouring many ships. The natural defences inherent to the island and its position not too far from King's Landing, yet not too close either, make it an advantageous temporary residence that Danny could utilise to ground her army and prepare for war. Coming from a meta perspective, it's uncertain exactly how much of this story will fit into the crammed pages of The Winds of Winter, and we do get the impression that she has a lot of story yet to be told following her arrival on the shores of Westeros, so it's anybody's guess where she'll be in the latter pages of The Winds of Winter. Danny is expected by many readers to face off with Aegon Targaryen, John Connington, and the Golden Company at some stage. And whether this conflict reaches our pages in Winds or in A Dream of Spring is difficult to assess at this juncture. But the Daenerys chapters of The Winds of Winter will be concerned foremost with Danny resolving her eastern arc, forming an army and transporting her troops to Westeros, a series of events that have excited readers for years. Daenerys Targaryen is coming home, and the wider question is, will Westeros really feel like home to her? Only time will tell. Thanks so much for joining us today as we explored what's going on with Daenerys in the Dothraki Sea and where her Winds of Winter arc might be taking her. We'll be back soon with another regular episode as well as a companion live stream for this episode. But now it's time for us to give credit where credit is due. Thanks to George R.R. R. Martin for giving us so many complex characters to analyze, and thanks to Kevin McLeod and Kai Angle for allowing us to use their music in our production. And as usual, we'll end today with thanks to our patrons from the Castle Steel level. If you enjoy the podcast, consider being a patron and you could be hearing your name here too. Our heartfelt thanks to Yvonne, Woodside for Life, Quarren Halfhand, Virginie, Hema Helmet, the Sellsword Sentinel, Theo, the Cannibal of Casterly Rock, the Tattered Princess, Sir Terence, Knight of the Cedars, Terry, Cern, Sheila, Sherry, Sir Swift, Sir Daniel, the Sneaky Russian, Scott, Scott Greenseer, Sarah, Sam, Richard, Paul H., Paul B., Philip, PJ, Peter Pebble, Patrick, anime lover Nicole, Mitchell, Michael, Maester Mary, Melinda, Lady Beatrix of House Grey, and our cohort of Matts, Matt A., Matt C., Matt K and Matt L. Also thanks to Margareta, 
Maria, Lord Young of the Ghostwoods, Lemmy B, Lena Snow, known as the Twilight Star, the Knight of the Laughing Tree, Sir Galahoo of what? Tree Girl, Brash Candy, Lady Kelly, Mistress of the Old Bay of Crabs, Catherine, Judson, Julie Beth of Tarth, John Aris, Rider of the Ice Dragon, Sonarion, the White Storm, Winter's King, Jim McGeehan, Goldie Juke, Brynden Beefish, Archmaester Kobe of the Higher Mysteries, Ingveld, History of Westeros, Greg, Felix, Ezra, Emily of the Eerie, Esme, Eric, Direwolf, Dennis, Dimitri B, Dan the Good, Dan S, Dag Blah Blah, Sir Archibald Cadogan, Convenience or Death, Sir Duncan Cole, Clay, Maddie and Jessica, Christine, Christian, Chris, Charitable Rereadings, Casey, Camille, Brian, Arshia, Oakenfist, Amber, Allie B, Allie C, Alex, Aegon the Sixth, and AJ. As always, let us know if I've pronounced any of your names wrong, if you have a nickname you'd prefer to use, or if you feel we've left anything out. Visit RadioWesteros.com for quick access to all our podcasts. You can also find a link to our Patreon campaign, donate via PayPal or Coffee, and comment on our content there. Or find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. And of course, you can connect with us via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or email. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you soon with a new episode. Bye for now.